Okay, so we've been thinking about this moment as a, a time to reflect on what have been going on uh, for the, on during these two days. Um, um, we're going to successively, I'm going to speak first, then Eve is going to speak, and finally, Alan will do that. So we've got each of us has got a job, a specific job to do. So, so let me start now. Now, first of all, I'd like you to, uh, I hope you're going to forgive me. Uh, I had to do this in a very uh, little time. So uh, I'm not sure I will always be clear because I'm not, as you know, English is not my native language. Now, what we've heard during these two days are, uh, is, has been very rich. Uh, but also very much entangled, which is part of what diary seems, seems to be whenever we try to have a, an overview. Now, what we've seen and heard is a huge variety of making diaries, but also of keeping diaries. And so um, I have been trying to um, find some threads, if you like, from talks and question and answer sessions, bearing in mind that uh, we have throughout the two day we've have we've have had two strands all the time probably not as stable as a rule diaries per se are products of material culture which is a making aspect and the second strand is diarist and the relation they have with their diaries which is a keeping aspect now in this conference, we've been very happy to uh, have uh, historians meet archivists. This, is, this was something which was very precious for Eve and I, and uh, that was part of the idea we uh, submitted to Alan, who, which he liked very much as well. So we've been very happy to have these uh, people all together thinking about diaries. Um, so the making of an archive, um, of course, initiated our, um, our conference because the making of an archive is essential, not only for accessing resources, but also to learn about diaries before they are made into an archive. So this is really a first construction, uh, which is very important. Uh, it is very important because it's the basis of all the other processes that are likely or not to happen afterwards. Digitalization now has a role to play in all aspects and at all stages of this uh, process, which is either at the level of, uh, of the archives, but also at the level of research, when we are actually researching uh, physically through catalogs, uh, accessing uh, uh, 55 years of diaries is, is a very lengthy process, so digitalization can help. But it's also uh, the role of the archives, or one of the potential role is to make large collections available for research in a very, uh, in a much easier way than uh, uh, it is at the moment. The second point, I've got seven points. So the second point is the context of writing. Uh, it's obvious that um, for many examples and case studies we heard, um, Diaries are about a, a sort of process, a self-reflecting writing process, when it's not an injunction, which is another context that we had, uh, an injunction either as a commercial, a colonial, or a social uh, enterprise, or a military enterprise as well. So, so injunctions can be very varied as well, and the relation of the diarist to the diary is, of course, very different uh, in this particular case. Although, as we had several examples, even within injunctions or context of injunctions, there are spaces that you can that the diarist can make or that the historian can find as sort of hidden voices. Now, this context of writing is, in fact, very complex because it's the expression of humanity in its wider sense. And I, I'm aware this is a, a really flat comment, but uh, I think it explains the difficulty to get in uh, diaries as, uh, or to find a sort of methodology uh, about you know, studying and looking at diaries. Now, it is clearly the expression of human experience 
as we had examples about war times, gender issues or trauma, which were um, some of the big uh, issues that we had about people getting into making or keeping diaries. Several of us have uh, thought about the necessity or the uh, propose, they have thought about proposing a framework uh, defining the self, uh, uh, the relation of the self versus diary, it, identifying various selves for the same diarist, which uh, makes us enter the space which I find personally fascinating, which is the fluctuation of identities. Uh, another um, aspect which has been uh, underlined is that you, we could also get into diaries through various stages that we could look at. And it's more than just defining the diaries as a material production, but it is also looking at the diary as a making, as being made by a self. So it's, it's both a material definition and a definition of the self producing in the end this diary. Although we think of diaries as self-reflecting writings or e ego stories in a way, um, we have, we have had several uh, cases where, uh, in fact, the diary, diary keeping was a way to encounter other selves uh, as either readers but, or co-writers. So we got example of family diaries, uh, secretarial helpers, a variety of collaboration and collaboration collaborators, but also a variety, a variety of reasons for collaboration. So again, uh, this is something which uh, uh, we find, I think we found quite attractive. Fourthly, there is also this necessity to think of diaries, not only as individual experiences, but also as collective experiences, even though it's a self-writing, self-reflecting uh, writing. Um, so this, I think, is slightly different from uh, looking at a diary in context. The individual experience, as well as the collective experience, contribute to build lives and so uh, to build shared narratives, even though they may look like individualized narratives. Um, whether in a single authored diary or in a multiple authored diaries. So, of course, time and place uh, are very important, but I think injunctions are as well, because injunctions are the phrasing of individual and collective experience. So as such, they are quite interesting in the making and the keeping of diaries. Another uh, um, element that we had, which also was quite interesting, is the way authors can use their diaries. So they can use their diaries as a self-functioning item. So you just get inside the diary, don't really look outside the diary. But diaries can also be used as, I'm not sure of the pronunciation of this one, pivot or pivot, pivot pivot or an interface um, where the diaries exist for itself, but it is also a diary that exists to feed the immediate environment of the author and the diary. So there is life for the diary, if I may say so, outside the diary. And this is of course constructed by authors themselves. And this is what we said yesterday about diaries as tools uh, specific tools for specific tasks, or in other case studies we heard throughout these two days, tools for unspecified, unintended objectives. Now, this, of course, means that more issues are at stake, such as the economics of publishing diaries, which is something very important, which is partly an answer to why or how authors can use the diaries. But it also, I think, another question, which is uh, something that Frank called a model of scientific creativity, which we could exchange for uh, non-scientific non um, notebooks, as I would call a reliable model of purpose. 
So the great uh, variety of uses, context and objectives uh, should not obscure the fact that diaries are in fact very much Western expressions of the self, of individual selves, but also individual selves functioning within a much larger framework, which, which is or which are the narrative self. So individual selves or entities, I'm thinking of family diaries or couple diaries, uh, are also uh, another stage towards uh, the collective experience of a time and place. I'd like to point out that uh, there is also a very large and potential scope for emancipatory ventures, uh, even in a tradition that is imported. And perhaps it is because of this import, I'm thinking of the West Bengal um, um, case study, it's through the import uh, that uh, these female voices in colonial Bengal could phrase their longing and emotional outlet and aspirations. Perhaps more, we'd like to know more about that, but perhaps more um, candidly and more honestly, that would be the case in most of the case studies we've heard when there is, despite uh, there being diaries, there have been some sort of a, um, perhaps not shyness, but not really uh, saying absolutely everything. There is some sort of a self-censorship about what is written in the diary. Now, even with specific social or commercial pressures, spaces could certainly be found or exploited, perhaps unexpectedly, which contributes to not only the injunction, but also it contributes to create uh, spaces outside or despite injunctions. So again, it means that uh, we can find a sort of multi-leveling of context for the same space and time that you find in the diary, which, come, which makes me think again of the fluidity of expression. Uh, and also of a great potential for, as somebody said this morning, excavation. So the typology, a typology to look into diaries remains uh, very complicated to phrase or to phrase convincingly at least, whether the production, that is to say the making of diary or the keeping of it is concerned. Uh, and I think the problem, uh, a typology would fix something which seems to be by nature fluid and fluctu fluctuant, uh, identities and formats and changes through time as well for the same diary and the same person. Now, this is probably because diary making and keeping in the end seems to be a process, a process uh, which is, of course, uh, measuring and uh, uh, aiming at an achievement, whatever it is, but it is a description of the process, a description of these dynamics at work, uh, which is very difficult to uh, explain and to sort of generalize. And I don't think digitalization as a sort of reproduction of the materiality of a uh, of diaries is going to help on this question of the process or the dynamics of keeping and making diaries. Now, the process is, as, been, as it has been mentioned several times, is about self-recognition, the recognition of the self as a diary keeper, as an achievement for a self-centered experience, but also as a self reaching out to others uh, whenever you have people trying to or wondering about what's going to happen to my uh, to my diary once I'm dead or organizing uh, the existence of their diaries beyond their own death. So this uh, organization uh, obviously shows that the process is going on. It's about self-awareness, but it's also about the idea that self-awareness is of interest to others. So there is this idea that uh, in diaries have a potential uh, to show the environment, whatever it can be, uh, that self-awareness from others is of interest uh, to others. So diaries as ego documents, uh, uh, 
have a potential for sharing uh, in terms of interest for others, but also in terms of improving your diary or making your diary more effective so that perhaps diary keepers would make others interested both in the venture, making and keeping a diary, but also in the uh, interest itself of this particular diary. So there is a sort of interactivity between selves and others, even though, and I think this is a paradox, uh, diary keepers usually write about themselves. Now, and this is my last point, in a digital age um, and, and a, a sort of a, uh, perhaps more interest even than ever in life writing. There is indeed, as has been said in the last session, uh, the uh, danger is not about the future of diaries. I mean, diaries, whatever the form, their format or the shape uh, will still exist. So this is not going to be jeopardized. But what the problem seems to be more about the future of records and this is indeed a very challenging issue. Over to you, Eve. Thank you, Miriam. I have been listening in awe to that summary and evaluation of the discussions that we've been having, which have been really wonderful um, over the last two days. So thank you to everybody. Um, as Miriam said, uh, we've each got a job to do in this sort of wrap up session. And my job is quite a practical one um, to outline um, where we might go next quite in quite sort of immediate terms um, in terms of of this project um, and, and this conference. Alan mentioned at the, the beginning of the conference yesterday that we had redesigned the program for these first two days of the conference, which has meant that we have added a third day uh, to our conference program. Um, and so my first job uh, in this wrap up session is to give you a date for your own diary, if you like, which is the 27th of April, so around a month's time, when we will be running uh, the third day of this conference as a, an online conference. Um, and we hope that all of you who've taken part today, or as many of you as possible, um, will be able to attend that online conference um, and we have selected to run it online in the hope that this will allow us as, as many of you as possible to attend and it also won't involve you in any additional travel um, or accommodation costs. So Miriam, Allen, and myself will be finalising the programme for that uh, 27th of April um, meeting um, and we'll be uh, emailing you with that um, as well as instructions on um, how to join on the day. But in brief, um, the third day of our conference will feature our second keynote speaker, um, Claire, uh, Professor Claire Langemer who will be talking about um, diaries in the social, the British Social Investigative Organisation Mass Observation, which was founded in the late 1930s as a project partly anthropological to explore um, uh, everyday life and um, cultures of everyday life. And Professor Langemer's talk will focus on some of the many diaries um, that were collected as part of that uh, social research project. Um, and she's particularly interested in thinking about the emotional textures of those diaries. Um, and she's going to be exploring in her talk how emotion um, is, is being, um, can be seen and, and can be read by the historian through thinking about the writing and the writers, but also through thinking about the, the goals of the, the researchers in this social investigative project. So I think, um, that this keynote talk will really develop some of the fascinating discussions we've been having over days one and two um, around emotion and diary keeping um, and emotion and, and um, diary collections. We'll also have at the um, third day of our conference talks from an additional five or six speakers who were unable to give their talks um, either today or yesterday for a number of reasons. And we're really delighted that those additional talks will be from both historians and archivists once again. So our interdisciplinary cross-disciplinary conversations will very much be um, continuing 
um, and at the, at the fore um, in our next day of the conference. So this third day of the conference is a great opportunity to develop our conversations further and with all the speakers and delegates who originally uh, registered to um, come to the conference. The programme for that day will also include a dedicated discussion session for all speakers and delegates, really as a way of marking a next stage in our journey, if you like. So this discussion session, and we will be planning the, the, the sort of format that that will take, but we would like that to be a space to reflect on core themes, core questions further, core problematics um, that have been emerging over the course of the conference um, as a whole. Um, so, as I said, Miriam and I, Miriam, Alan and I will be finalising the format of that um, session following our conference days um, that we've just had. But if anybody has particular ideas for key areas of discussion or key themes that you um, think would be very fruitful to be part of that discussion session, please do reach out to us. Um, please, please send us an email. Um, um, we will we will sort of think further about about the, the final structure for that session. So really um, a call, call to action from, from us at this stage um, to, to put on hold the 27th of April in your diary if you can, um, because we would love to see um, as many of you back for that um, final day as possible. Um, and also just to have a think about any sort of areas for the discussion session that you'd be particularly interested um, to, to happen and, and get in touch with us um, about those. Um, so I think that that was kind of my, my main um, things to, to deliver. Um, Alan, I think this is a good point to hand over to you to talk about any other ways we might want to build on these two days. Okay, well, Eve, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to keep my remarks brief. Um, Eve and Miriam, as you've seen and heard, are the real experts, and um, I stand in awe in all that they've achieved in putting this wonderful programme together. Um, I've only got five points. Um, first one um, is that my conclusions at this stage are certainly provisional because I want to discuss what we've heard and what we've learned with the rest of the Archive Centre team and particularly with um, those that you've heard from and have been so involved um, in this conference and I, who I know have, are already thinking about further projects and ideas based around some of our diaries and diarists. And obviously we, we hope to sort of start these conversations fairly quickly so that we can feed our deliberations into the follow-up online event that, that Eve has just mentioned. That said, um, and on to my second point, these two days have been hugely useful to us as archive professionals in introducing us to the range and types of research project being undertaken. And I think in doing so, it's provided us with a timely reminder of our role and responsibilities as custodians and curators um, of this material. And I, I think for me, one of the recurring themes in this conference has been the way in which diaries and the voices they contain are reinterpreted through subsequent editorial intervention and publication. And it seems to me that that must include our processes as archivists in selecting, appraising, cataloguing, transcribing, displaying, and in some cases, um, publishing the material, as we've just done with Mary Soames's diaries. And I think in doing that, we need to be very mindful of what we're introducing and also what we're emitting, and perhaps think about ways in which we can be more transparent about our processes for researchers now and in the future. Third point is, is, is visibility. Um, we need to think about, and I know the Archive Centre team are already thinking about the visibility of our resources. Of course, diaries can be buried in large uncatalogued collections and there are issues of terminology. I was having a really interesting conversation last night with Angelina about whether notebooks are diaries, whether journals are diaries, whether scrapbooks are diaries. Um, and I think the conclusion of this conference is probably that they all can be, 
um, and that they're certainly all forms of life writing. But it highlights the fact that these linkages between different diaries, different types of life writing and different collections may not be immediately apparent in catalogues, indexes, um, on, on websites, because different terms have been used by creators and archivists to describe them. Um, but thankfully, Cherish uh, and others in the team are already doing good work on, 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 on how we identify and deal with that. Um, and of course, we're also continuing to collect. Um, and we want to ensure that we are collecting as diverse a range of voices as possible. We have a collecting policy um, and a collections development policy that we need to work within. But I think there is scope to widen our collections on grounds of gender, race, and background. Um, and on to my sort of fourth point, and that I've called big data. Um, Professor Pashansky, um, in his talk, highlighted the possibility of doing things on a larger scale um, with digitization, in collaboration of others. Um, and we might start to think about a project that looked across the range of diaries and facilitated comparisons across series and across collections. Because up to now, our approach has tended to be based on individual collections, on individual diaries. But of course, as we invest in new technology and as we go forward in some of the ways that have been described, I, I think there is scope to think about bigger projects. Um, and then finally, my, my last point, I think what the last two days has shown is that we can, I think, once again, stage gatherings like this. Um, and we have the ability to bring people together, to bring them together um, on, in person, um, but also online. And, you know, Andrew was remarking um, um, just before um, he chaired his session that, you know, one of the great things about this gathering is that we've been able in the last two days to bring people together um, from India, from France, from Ireland, from, from the UK and, and, and so on. Um, and that is in a large part due to the unsung heroes of this conference, who are the AV department sitting in the box up there. And I just thought, could you join me in just giving a round of applause to Chris, Chris and Paul. Um, and that really brings me to the end and to the thanks. I want to thank Eve and Miriam. They've been um, an absolute pleasure to, to, to work with. Of course, we need to thank our sponsors, the Universities of Paris, Le Havre and Southampton. Um, want to thank all the speakers and delegates and all the teams here at Churchill College who've made this conference possible, but particularly Amanda for all of the hard work that she's put in on the logistic. Um, but thanks to everyone in the room, everyone online. And I think with that, we stand adjourned. There's more coffee for those here um, over in the buttery or even the possibility of something stronger. Thank you. Yeah.